Okay, so let's start. Uh, hi everyone, thanks for coming. We are very excited to have today Sarah uh, Vigreffen. She's a PhD student at Georgia Tech working on interpretable deep learning methods for NLP. In her free time and not during the pandemic, she enjoys traveling, rock climbing, and rock music. And today she's going to talk uh, about her recent work, Measuring Association Between Labels and Free Text Rationale. Uh, so before we start, I'll just remind you, uh, Sari has no problem with taking questions during the talk. Just raise your hand and I'll refer you to her. And in the end of the talk, we usually take questions either by um, Dory or uh, you can just pop in. Uh, take it away, Sarah. Thanks. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, so I'll be presenting work which is in collaboration um, with uh, colleagues at AI2 and the University of Washington on um, uh, free text rationalization. Okay, so a brief outline for the talk, um, just to keep things in order. I'll start with some background about the definitions that we'll use and different types of rationales. Um, then I'll provide motivation for the tasks and models that we uh, wanted to investigate in this paper. Um, and then there are two sets of experiments and each set has two research questions that we asked um, regarding different types of model architectures for um, the question of generating free text rationales. Um, and then I'll end with some conclusions and uh, thoughts for discussion. So starting with definitions. Um, so the ML pipeline can sometimes be thought of as these three distinct steps. Um, there's data collection and processing, there's model development, and then there's model evaluation. Um, so I think that interpretability should consider all three aspects of this pipeline as well. Um, in this talk, I'll be focusing on model development and model evaluation, um, but I will tease that I have a paper coming out in the next couple of weeks um, on collection and pre-processing as well, but I won't have time to cover that today. <laughs> so. so to define the type of explanation that um, my research mostly focuses on, um, we call these, or these are called local explanations because they generally explain individual instances um, rather than the model as a whole. And the goal is to understand models decision-making processes for individual instances. Um, this has a variety of use cases, including debugging, validating safety, uh, looking for un unintended biases and behavior, and is especially important in applications like fact-checking and fake news checking. Importantly, generally, we require explanations that accurately reflect um, how uh, instances were labeled, as opposed to um, things that might appear plausible or sensible to human uh, humans. So I call this faithful explainability. Um, and the idea is that the explanation we hope would explain the model's true decision-making process um, as much as as possible and not evaluate the plausibility or the human perception of the rationales. Um, although these can be mixed objectives in some sense. This is a really difficult question. Um, so it's by no means answered or potentially even fully answerable, but I'll touch on that later in the talk. So the motivation for this work, um, recent uh, work by other authors has, has argued that faithfulness should be viewed as a spectrum. Um, and not a binary criterion because it is potentially very, you know, very difficult to achieve and we may never have full guarantees um, of what model internals look like for individual instance decisions. There are two common approaches to doing this, um, architecture development and test suites, which fall respectively under the model development and the model evaluation parts of the machine learning pipeline. Oh. Um, and then in this figure, I've kind of shown how, um, I'll get to this figure again, I think on a, a future slide, but ideally um, people have developed different methods, either architectures or testing suites for um, different types of explanations to try to situate them on this gradient. Um, I'll briefly introduce two types of textual rationales that are the most popular and the ones I'm going to be talking about in this work. Um, I'll use the term explanation and rationale interchangeably. They, there is some nuance potentially in how we use this terminology, but I won't um, get into that in this talk. 
So the first um, common type of rationale in NLP is a highlight or an extractive rationale, which is a subset of the input. So in this example from Common Sense QA, um, for the question, while eating a hamburger with friends, what are people trying to do? The answer choices are have fun, tasty, or indigestion. And the correct answer is have fun. So a human annotator, a crowd worker, has annotated a highlight here, hamburger with friends, to explain the correct label. The second type is free text, also sometimes called natural language explanations or abstractive explanations. Um, and these are strictly more expressive because instead of only selecting from the input, you could select from you know, either your entire vocabulary, the, the explanation generators, entire vocabulary. Um, and these are more naturally occurring in the sense that this is often how humans would verbally or in writing um, explain actions. So you can see the free text rationale also collected from um, a crowd worker for this instance is usually a hamburger with friends indicates a good time. Um, the highlight type of rationale has been widely used in data sets that I kind of will class as information extraction style data sets or machine reading data sets. Um, for example, movie reviews, sentiment analysis, the goal is to find specific keywords in the document that indicate the sentiment. Um, and then there's a number of question answering uh, data sets like multi-RC, where the goal is to find the answer within a larger document. Um, so it's feasible to highlight where that answer is located in the document or the parts of the document that justify um, why the answer was selected. So in prior work of ours, we introduced pipeline models as one possible architecture development for highlight style rationales. The pipeline is actually constructed of two separately trained models. So in the first set, we have an input to rationale model that takes the input here, the movie review, and outputs a subset of the input. So the tokens that would be considered the rationale, um, such as the acting is great and the action more than makes up for it. And then the second model in the pipeline is trained only on the basis of the rationale to predict here the sentiment. Um, and the key is there's actually no gradient flow between these two models. So the construction of this architecture is based on the sufficiency assumption um, from the seminal uh, rationalizing neural predictions paper of 2016. Um, and the sufficiency assumption says that the explanation should be sufficient to make the prediction on its own. So here um, in the second step of the model, when the prediction actually happens, it's only on the basis of the rationale. Um, also, the benefit of this architecture is that the prediction is explicitly conditioned on the explanation. So we've essentially um, done some type of compression of the input um, into a more uh, succinct set of tokens um, from which the prediction can be made. Um, it's definitely not perfect. So for example, we don't know exactly how the prediction is made. We don't know what the makeup of the predictor model looks like. And it's possible that the model, of course, uses tokens in a way that is different from the semantic interpretation that we give them when we read the rationale. Um, now we'll talk about other types of tasks that we wanted to investigate in this work where highlights aren't the best suited type of rationale. So recently in NLP, we've, we've developed a lot of data sets that are more focused on reasoning or understanding. I'll use those in quotes um, because I guess there's a little bit of debate there about terminology. But the idea is that by design, the tasks are designed so that the answer is not explicitly stated in the input. Um, and it is designed to probe kind of um, implicit understanding or multi-hop reasoning um, that is captured uh, within the model's parameters. So here we again have the common sense QA example. Um, and the point here is that you can tell that the highlight really doesn't explain everything needed to predict the answer have fun. Um, and so the natural language rationale definitely fills in at least one reasoning step uh, that is missing from the highlight. And we can see the same for natural language inference. Um, here for this premise and hypothesis, um, the premise describes a child and a woman on a swing, and the hypothesis describes a mother and a daughter. The label is neutral because as the human annotated rationale states, the child does not imply daughter and the woman does not imply mother. 
but the human annotated uh, highlight here just highlights the words mother and daughter, which doesn't really explain how you reach the neutral label. So looking at prior work that has used pipeline architectures or variants of pipelines, um, we can see that for the vast majority of data sets, which we can consider to be a machine reading or information extraction style, um, there's an agreement on the type of rationale, which is here E stands for extractive or a highlight rationale. But for the tasks that we can class as more reasoning or understanding, there's not really a consensus about the best type of rationale, specifically because pipelines were designed for highlight rationales. Um, so we wanted to investigate further um, given that we think that natural language or free text rationales are really important for reasoning tasks and will become increasingly more important moving forward, um, can we actually use this type of architecture for free text rationalization? Great, so we're back to the motivation. Um, so we talked about architecture developments for highlight rationales. Um, and then in this talk, we specifically want to focus on free text explanations for reasoning tasks, which hasn't really been investigated, what types of architectures or tests we could use um, for models that generate these rationales. Okay, now I'll briefly explain the models that we investigated. Um, and the research question is, what are modeling options for free text rationales? And here um, we want to evaluate existing models for desirable properties. And in this talk, we use T5 as a case study. So all the models I describe are based on um, T5 architecture and pre-trained weights, um, but it is extensible to other architectures. So I introduced pipeline models for highlights. Um, so a pipeline model for pretext rationalization would look like this. Um, we again, generate our rationale usually a hamburger with friends is a good time. And then that is what is used to make the prediction. There's also a very common and kind of uh, very extensible and flexible architecture, which jointly decodes both a label and a rationale. And we're going to call this the joint model, which goes from input to output plus rationale. And I will use this notation when I present the results where I stands for input and O is output and R is rationale. So here we've decoded both the label and the rationale. Um, and they have nice properties. So there's high task performance. As you can imagine, the pipeline can suffer from cascading errors. Um, and also if you think of like a graphical model, it would be useful to have you know, relationships between all three components and to predict an output based on both the input and rationale or predict a rationale based on the input and the predicted label. Um, a pipeline kind of linearizes that. Um, and while we showed in our prior work that for highlights, you don't lose performance with a pipeline generally, um, we don't know about that in the, in the free text rationale case. So in the joint model, we also generally see that when we add the explanation generation capability, we don't lose task performance. They're more parameter efficient than pipelines. So in this work, the pipeline is represented by two T5 instantiated models and the joint model has half the number of parameters because it's only instantiated by one T5 um, pre-trained model. And they're flexible and easy to use. It's basically just adding a multitask objective um, or in the case of language generation, you simply are just decoding a longer sequence. Um, so they're, they're much more simple to implement in some sense. Which brings us to my research questions. The first question that I already kind of hinted at is, can we apply pipelines to tasks that require free text explanations? And the second question is, can we then create tests to place joint models somewhere on the spectrum or better understand um, how reliable the free text explanations they produce actually are? So in the first set of experiments, we'll look at the question of pipelines. And we propose two experiments to kind of investigate the quality um, of the free text rationales that pipelines produce, and also whether that sufficiency assumption is even valid. Um, like I mentioned, um, it can seem a little counterintuitive to 
uh, consider the free text explanation on its own because it's not a subset of the input. Um, but we wanted to test this empirically. So to test the explanation quality of generated rationales, um, we basically wanna test how well an explanation indicates the label it is designed to explain. And also an auxiliary objective of this is we can test how similar generated rationales are to the gold set. Um, that can be done via a variety of automated metrics, but we're just going to consider that an auxiliary objective that we will obtain via our experiment to answer the first, the first uh, testing question. So here's a bad example. This is an example from a model that's trained on common sense QA. For the instance, a crane uses many a steel cable when working a what? And the answer choices are ship, winch, and construction site. The correct answer is construction site. And the model predicts the correct answer, which is great. But the rationale it gives is actually an unrelated fact that explains a different answer choice. Um, cranes are used to work on ships. So even though the model predicted the correct label, the explanation really isn't related to that label whatsoever. Um, and it might be a true fact, but it's not really sufficient um, from a plausibility perspective. A human reading this would not find this to be a useful rationale. And that's the question we wanna answer in this first set of experiments on explanation quality. So we actually use the second model in the pipeline, the rationale to output model, um, in order to test how well you can predict um, a label from its explanation. So the idea is that if the label does indicate the explanation that it is designed to explain, or sorry, if the explanation indicates the label it was designed to explain, this model should achieve high accuracy. So we train it on the gold set and that's an upper bound kind of on our performance. But then at testing time, we can test on the gold and we can also test on the rationales that come from both the first stage of the pipeline that's generating rationales and also the rationales generated by a joint model that's trained to uh, do the multitask objective, which we believe would be important to actually have rationales that explain uh, their predicted labels. And here are the results we see. We have the gold upper bound for the three uh, data sets and tasks that we investigate. And we can see that the pipeline models have a large drop from the gold performance that is larger than the joint models, which have a smaller drop. So this indicates that explanations that are generated as a function of the input and the predicted label are more label informed and they better indicate um, the label they're designed to explain. They also have less of a drop off from the gold set, um, which can indicate kind of how much that distribution has shifted. There are task specific differences, which will come back later in the talk as well. Um, for example, ESNLI generally, um, we can perform better with this type of model and COSI is generally, which is the common sense QA task. Um, there's a bigger drop. I won't really get into our hypotheses about why that is, um, but we do elaborate on them a bit more in the paper. So we've answered the first resource question in section four, how does the architecture affect generated explanation quality? And we found that uh, joint models produce better quality explanations as measured by the ability to predict the label. Now we'll ask if the sufficiency assumption of a pipeline architecture is actually valid for all explanation types. So essentially what we wanna do is we're gonna use the ground truth explanations here as an upper bound. And we wanna test whether when we include the input, we actually have better task performance. So what this looks like is actually just reappending the input to the rationale. So now the label is being predicted as a function of both the input and the rationale. And if we believe that they're complementary um, or not sufficient, we would see this would have a lot higher performance. And then once we do this, we do retrain. So here are the results. Um, for all tasks, we improve task performance by re-adding the input to with the rationale, um, which we call the IR to O model, input and rationale to output. And the drop is rather substantial for COSI datasets, which indicates that the sufficiency assumption is not universal 
across tasks requiring free text rationales. So to conclude the first set of experiments, um, we wanted to test, you know, do pipelines work in this, this newer setting of free text explanation generation? And the answer is not cleanly. Um, we saw that joint models produce more label informed explanations, which are more plausible to human users. And the sufficiency assumption doesn't hold for all tasks, especially on COSI, we see a very large drop um, when we try to predict a label on the basis of only the rationale. Which brings us to our second question, can joint models serve as an alternative to pipelines when we'd like to produce free text rationales and have some notion of how tied they are to the model's prediction decisions? So we've discussed previously that joint models, which decode a multitask, are trained on a multitask objective and decode both the label and the predicted rationale, they have a lot of benefits. Um, but we don't really understand um, how tied within the model the production of the two uh, outputs actually is. And I'll give this quote from Narang et al. 2020, which is the state-of-the-art joint model for free text rationalization at the moment, I believe. Um, and they essentially uh, train T5 to do this multitask objective. Um, the model is called WT5. And this is a quote from the conclusion of their paper. Much like humans, our approach does not guarantee that the produced explanation actually explains the specific reasons why a model generated its prediction. In other words, the model could potentially just make up a reasonable sounding explanation instead of providing an accurate description of its causal decision-making process. Um, and we can consider the case that these are massively over-parameterized models. So it's actually not infeasible that when trained on two different task losses, even though they are um, trained data is paired, it is possible that these two tasks could be performed completely independently within the model. Um, and that's kind of what we wanna test in our second set of experiments. Um, so obviously understanding um, the kind of the internal mechanisms of a large uh, over-parameterized neural model is a very difficult research question and we are not proposing to answer it completely. Um, and there are also a variety of methods to do this and we will just propose two. Um, but we wanted to simplify this into like a minimally necessary property, which is that the mechanisms producing a label and the mechanisms producing a predicted rationale should be tied in some way. Um, and to clarify how this is different from the label informedness um, kind of rationale quality measure that we discussed in section one, that was an instance-based measure. So it actually had nothing to do um, with kind of this, this um, overlap within the model's parameters. So this is a model-based method, which we assume white box access to the, um, the generating model. Here's another, here's returning to our um, example of the bad rationale from before about the crane and the construction site from COSI. I've updated the rationale here to be what we consider high quality. Cranes are used to work on construction sites. So in this case, the rationale actually does explain the label, construction site, but this doesn't actually mean that we know that they were generated from the same mechanisms within the model, um, which is kind of how this metric differs from label informedness. Really the question is like how much parameter sharing is happening. Um, again, very difficult question. We tried a number of methods for this, including canonical correlation analysis, um, and I think that there are potentially a lot of other ways to solve this that could be explored in future work as well. Um, but we'll, we propose two measurements to, to test this question um, and I'll go through each independently. We first test robustness equivalence and then the second one is called feature importance agreement. So robustness equivalence. We establish an axiom um, of a property we believe these models should have, and then we test that property and present the results on our T5 case study. So the axiom is that the label prediction and the explanation generation mechanisms 
should be equally robust or non-robust um, when noise is applied to the model at inference time. So the method is quite simple. We take our joint model that's been trained um, and then we inject zero mean Gaussian noise into the first layer embeddings of the model. And we observe how the decoded explanations and labels change as a function of this noise. So there are four possible observable outcomes um, that we can observe as we inject noise. And a lot of them uh, depend on the amount of noise that is injected. So the first two cases, a stable label and a stable explanation, um, indicate that both the label, predicted label and the predicted explanation are robust to the noise. And then if both are unstable, they're both non-robust. These two cases demonstrate robustness equivalence. In the second two cases, if one uh, predicted output is robust and the other is not, that would demonstrate that they're not equivalent, which might indicate that um, they're not having substantial enough parameter overlap within the model. Um, because the noise does not equally affect both uh, generation capabilities. This is our running example. Um, and on the, the kind of the y axis here, each row indicates um, the value of the uh, variance of the Gaussian noise. Um, and as we increase the value, you can see that the output of the model starts to degrade substantially, which is expected. But what's important here is that in the range of zero to 15, we observe that both the predicted label and the predicted explanation are important, are, um, sorry, stable. So we're seeing that from zero to 15, the label doesn't change. And then even though the explanation is changing, it's still valid for the given instance. So for example, at a variance of 10, it changes to eating a hamburger with friends is fun, but that still adequately explains the label. Um, so you can note here that if, if we were to do kind of semantic similarity or word flip measures, we might not have an accurate representation of whether the explanation is still valid or not. Um, and we'll talk about how we automate this on the next slide. And then from a variance of 20 to 35, we see that both the generated explanation and the generated label degenerate and are unstable. Um, for example, the explanation, a hamburger is a hamburger, and the model cannot even produce um, one of the label choices. So we've observed um, robustness equivalence on this specific example, um, where both the label and the explanation are stable in some range, and then they both become unstable at some value. To scale this up across our entire test set, to get a better understanding of how the model operates as a whole, we need automated metrics. So measuring label, yes. Can you explain again what exactly is the noise that you insert in the model? Yeah, so there are, I think, a number of ways of injecting noise. We used a continuous variant instead of doing label flipping. Um, so for each embedding, after the words are initially embedded, before any um, attention happens, cross attention happens, we just inject zero mean Gaussian noise. And then the variance um, controls the, the, the amount of the noise, essentially. Uh, and what is the motivation behind that? Because like maybe it's not like it gets it out of the, its original distribution. Yeah, that's true. So I think we looked at prior work on robustness. And this is one approach that's commonly used, I believe. Um, and then we also did kind of look at how the word embeddings nearest neighbors change. So at low noise levels, the nearest neighbor embeddings do not change. Um, at higher levels, they do more often. I think that we could also look at word flips. I think that this can definitely be extended. There are a variety of ways we could inject noise. Um, I cannot remember why. There was a reason why word flipping was difficult. Yeah, I can't remember why, but I'll try to think about that. I do want to kind of extend this to word flipping cases. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 
Yes, okay, so back to the automated metrics. Um, so measuring how, how often labels change is um, really easy. We can just see, assuming there's one correct uh, label, we can just test when the label flips to an incorrect option. Um, or similarly, we can just measure how the test accuracy of the joint model changes, um, and these are correlated. Um, but to measure the validity of the explanations changing um, is a bit more tricky, as I mentioned. So paraphrase or semantic similarity measures aren't necessarily sufficient um, because we actually need to judge whether an explanation still explains the input and label um, that, that it's designed to explain, even if it does change in, in meaning, um, because there are many different ways to explain um, a prediction, even humans uh, do that. So we again use the automated metric um, that we use for label informedness, which is the accuracy of the trained rationale to output model and how well you can predict the predicted label from the predicted rationale. So this can give us an estimate of the degradation in label informedness. As we add noise, we can see how much the accuracy of this model drops, which can indicate also um, how out of distribution the predicted rationales have become. Um, this does assume that the rational to work output model is um, at least somewhat robust to these minor semantic uh, changes in the, in the explanations. And what we observe is that we observe robustness equivalence for the T5 uh, case study on the three data sets that we investigate. So we have three metrics on these graphs or three lines on these graphs. Um, the black line is the percent of label flips and the red line is the accuracy of the joint model. So these are correlated and they're both intended to measure um, the label explanation or sorry, the label flipping behavior. Um, and we can see that they do uh, follow a very similar trend. And then the blue line is the accuracy of the label informedness a proxy metric, which is the rationale to output model in the pipeline. Um, and what we observe here is that the area of largest slope is the same for both measures, which indicates that in this region of around 15 to 30 uh, variants, we are we're observing that both of them degrade in the same range. So from the range of zero to 15, this model is stable across all test instances, and in the range 30 to 50, it is unstable across all test instances. And we have similar findings for COSI. Um, it's a little bit less um, exactly aligned in the sense that we see that from the range zero to, or sorry, 10 to 25 variants is when the black and red lines are decreasing most substantially. And the rationale to output model is decreasing most substantially in the range 10 to 20. Um, but we generally consider this to be uh, similar enough to say that um, we're observing the stable, stable and unstable, unstable cases for both data sets. I think I remember a follow-up answer to your question, you know, which is partially that it is hard to quantify the amount of noise you've injected via label flipping. Um, or sorry, via word token flipping in the input, um, because I guess it depends like what token you're flipping to. I think so that that is part of the- Like maybe the number of tokens that you flip? Assuming that all flips are somehow invalidating or perturbing the input. I'm not sure if the number of flips right. is exactly correlated to the amount of noise that you're injecting. Wait, so by noise, do you mean, like, do you mean that it should change the answer of the rationale or should it maintain it? Um, I think we just wanted an axis of like the amount of perturbation. So I could see label, I mean, I see what you're saying that the number of flips could be a proxy for that. Um, I should think about this more. I think that's a good, that's a good follow up question. I actually have it as one of the, the final thoughts um, yeah, for the discussion. So Maybe it can be, maybe we can follow up after, but maybe it can be like a two plane kind of graph. So like some of the perturbation should not change the answer, right? Or like a, a actual paraphrases or um, things like that. And then and other kinds of perturbations or flip that do change the meaning. 
and then you should uh, have a decrease. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I think determining which word flips would fall in which category, like looking for synonyms or antonyms, and generally it kind of fits into the work of finding adversarial examples for natural language strings, which has some research, but not much, if I recall correctly, when I looked into it. Um, but ultimately, just following other robustness work, we decided to use the, um, the continuous approach because it's more, I think, quantifiable in some sense for this set of experiments, but it could definitely be expanded for sure. Yeah, so I think it did quantify by, by like, okay, so you have a nice graph with a clear, like, you know exactly what happened, or like, you, you know that there is more noise on the x-axis, but you can't really say if it's, like, if it is a perturbation that actually make a difference or not. Either, because you yeah. could say that uh, maybe with 5% noise, it doesn't really matter because maybe you fall into a synonym, but after 35%, it did actually make a difference. Yeah, I think also, if I remember correctly, um, we I looked at some work on the robustness of transformers and the amount, like the amount of noise, the, the variance here is actually quite high, but I, if I remember correctly, I think that actually aligned with this work showing that transformers are quite robust to this type of noise. Um, I'll try to look that up again and uh, maybe I can send it to you later if that's useful. Uh, if I may add something and token flipping, I, I wouldn't do it in this case because first it will be impossible to quantify the the actual noise, as you said before, but also it would change on the context and the language in which you are working. Mm. So even if it would be possible, the amount of work to actually do it uh, will be amazingly high, I'm guessing. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point too. Like if you somehow create another valid instance, and a different label is predicted for that instance, that doesn't mean that the model is not robust, right? Is that yes. what you're you can, uh, For some languages, you can just flip things and meaning is the same. And for some languages, mm -hmm. it's completely different. So you wouldn't even be able to, to say that the result that you obtained, the, the label that was picked is correct because the meaning of the phrase has changed. Ah, no, but it, it is important to understand if the meaning actually changed or not. And what I think is might be interesting is that to expect that the like robustness in the sense that if you make a meaningless change, it would still have the same answer. That's what I'm trying to say, that how do you decide it's meaningless? Yeah. You will have to analyze uh, so every single case. No, so it's hard, <laughs> but like there are some uh, heuristics that you can use. Uh, like at least in the simple case, it can be... Uh, maybe in English, but in other languages will be impossible. Yeah, that's that's quite a good point. I think as we also saw, thanks for that comment, by the way. Um, as we saw in the single instance example of the running example, there's like a very clear delineation when things are degraded, which I, I'm not sure you would get, um, again, if you're like flipping words and things are changing as they should change versus things are changing because there's a lack of robustness. Um, but I think this is a really interesting extension um, and I haven't thought much about it, but I wanna think about it more moving forward. Um, sorry, I have a higher level question. Um, so robustness equivalence seems like something that would be necessary, but it's not sufficient to indicate faithfulness, right? Like the models could degrade for different reasons in different ways and have nothing to do with each other. So how do you, maybe you're coming to this next, but how do you quantify that um, the degradation is actually something meaningful? I think if I understood your question correctly, the necessary but not sufficient part of this metric. Yeah, so as I mentioned, these are the two metrics that we propose are necessary, but definitely not sufficient. So we cannot say that the models produce faithful explanations because they pass these two metrics. It's more, if these models failed, that would be concerning. So like we should, you know, it's important to, to continue to expand this list essentially. I don't think it would ever be 100% comprehensive, which is again, ties back to the prior work kind of arguing that 
hundred percent faithfulness is probably not achievable and it depends how you define it. And it's a pretty vague quantity in general. Um, but yeah, we were more interested in for a few tests, you know, if the model fails, that's problematic. They pass, which means basically we should keep investigating or use them still cautiously, but um, I don't know, there might be other interesting cases where they don't exhibit some property that we believe they should exhibit. And how, like based on what you say, if they passed or not, like do you have like a threshold or how do you decide? Um, I guess we are just, yeah, that's a good question as well. Like for example, the COSI one on the side is like a little less in the same range of the two tasks as ESNLI, which looks very nicely, um, has this stable, stable, and unstable, unstable region on the graph. Um, yeah, that's also a good question. I think we would want to further quantify. That's not something we did in the paper. How do you um, actually turn this graph into some thresholded value? Could be interesting. Um, yeah, we didn't do that. Are there any more questions? I can't see chat or anything. Um, there are some on Dolly, but I think we can take them at the end. So. Okay, okay, that sounds good. Then I'll go through the last portion of the talk if I still have time for that. That's okay, okay, great. Okay, so the second test um, is the feature importance agreement, which again relies on an axiom that we established that we believe these models should exhibit. Um, and then we test them for the T5 case study as well. So for feature importance agreement, the axiom is that the important input tokens for label prediction and explanation gener generation mechanisms should be similar. Um, and so we use gradient attribution for this and I'll briefly kind of touch on what that is. So um, you can take the logits of some predicted output from a end-to-end -end model and then trace the gradients back to obtain uh, important scores of each token in the input. Um, and so what this results in is um, a rank of the input tokens. And as is common in the machine translation literature, um, the sum of all of the logits in the decoded string or output of the model um, is used to compute token uh, importance via gradient attribution. Um, but we actually decompose the sum into the two predicted tasks, which results in the logits of the predicted label and the logits of the, expl the predicted explanation. Um, and so instead of one token rank of the input tokens, we now have, with respect to each of these terms in the, in the decomposed expression, um, we end up with two token rank lists um, one with respect to the label prediction and one with respect to the explanation at generation. So now we're going to use occlusion to both validate whether the token attribution, uh, feature importance attribution agreement is um, valid for the individual tasks and then to do further analysis of this agreement between the two tasks and their feature attributions. Um, so we use the remove and retrain method from um, Hooker et al. And the method works as follows. So given some token rank for each instance, we want to determine if it adequately captures um, feature importance. So often um, these tokens are then occluded based on their rank in the, um, the feature importance. So we remove the top K percent of tokens from the token rank. And then the Hooker et al. paper um, advocates that you retrain the model on this occluded training set. Um, at these different values of occlusion. And then basically the drop in performance when you remove you know, the top K tokens versus a random baseline where you remove uh, a random K tokens can indicate whether your importance attribution um, metric is capturing the most important tokens in the input. And then obviously we, we expect to see a very large decay when we remove the top K importance tokens. And then as we as K gets larger, that decay will um, 
kind of taper off because the tokens become less and less important as ranked by the, um, the importance agreement metric. So we first do a reliability test of our gradient attributions before we use them. Um, because there's been a lot of work showing that, you know, there are a variety of different gradient attribution methods um, with various utilities, and we want to first determine which um, is best for our setting. So we run the ROAR test, um, where our token rank is determined by the gradients of the task. Um, so we take the gradients with respect to either the label prediction logits or the rationale prediction logits. And then we measure the drop in performance on the associated task. So um, this is the sanity check. Uh, first of all, we select the gradient attribution um, metric that best um, results in the largest drop based on this test. And secondly, we want to assure that when we remove tokens um, that are determined to be important for label prediction, we see a drop in label performance and vice versa for the rationales. So I have all the results on this graph, but I'm just going to talk about the first set now, and then I'll explain the actual results um, from the importance agreement assessment in a second. So on the left, we have the, um, the label prediction accuracy task. And on the x-axis, we have the percent of tokens that are occluded based on the token rank. So the blue line is the random baseline. So you can see that it's a relatively linear drop-off as we drop random tokens and as we increase that number of random tokens. Um, and then because in the left graph, we're looking at label prediction performance for the sanity check, when we remove label uh, important tokens for based on the label logits, which is the orange line, we see that we are substantially worse than random, which kind of validates um, the importance scores that we're um, achieving. So the orange line shows a very substantial drop when you remove the, the top 10%, and then as you remove lower percents, you essentially achieve a zero, zero percent uh, legal accuracy. And the reason for zero percent is because um, this is a generative model. So if it decodes something, it's not bound to the 33% um, lower bound that the general classification model would be. Um, and then on the left side, we have the rationale quality as measured by the rationale to output uh, label informedness proxy model. And um, here we do have that, low, that lower bound of 33%. Um, and it's less indicative here. Um, generally, the gap is, is much smaller, but we do see that um, when removing tokens with respect to the, the task, which is rationale logits, the green line, the green line is below the random, uh, the random baseline. So yes, OK. So now that we've kind of chosen a gradient attribution method based on that which caused the largest drop, um, those results are in the appendix of the paper. I didn't include the graph here. Um, now we can actually get on to measuring the feature importance agreement. So the only thing that changes is now when we compute the gradient with respect to either the label logits or the explanation logits, we are testing the accuracy on the opposite task. So if either of these directions results in a drop in accuracy compared to random, then we know that the tokens um, that are considered important for label prediction are also important for explanation generation and vice versa. So the key here is we're now going to test on the opposite task um, than what the future importance was determined according to. So back to the graphs. On the label accuracy task on the left side, we're now comparing the green line to the blue line. And on the rationale quality task, we're now comparing the orange line to the blue line. Um, and so for label accuracy, we see that it drops um, substantially um, when we determine token importance via the rationales. It, intuitively, it's not as large of a drop as when we determine importance with the actual task. Um, the label prediction, um, but it's still relatively substantial. And for rationale generation, uh, this gap is much smaller. So there is a slight drop um, when we use the label tokens to determine feature importance, but it's um, quite a bit narrower. But at least in one direction from rationale to label, we've determined that the same input tokens 
um, are important for both tasks as evidenced by the left graph. Um, so we generally conclude that um, on the COSI data set, which is given here, um, that we see feature importance agreement, at least to some extent. Again, quantifying this further is outside the scope of, of what we did in the paper, but I'm interested in that question as well. Um, and so to recap this, the conclusion of the second section, we wanted to create a few tests to better understand the joint models. Again, these are necessary, but not sufficient. Um, and I hope I can continue working on this line of work to kind of expand this list further. Um, but we first talked about how we could potentially quantify label rationale association, um, looking at model-based properties of the, the production of a label production and an explanation generation. And then we looked at robustness equivalence and feature importance agreement. And we concluded that T5-based models fine-tuned on our three tasks exhibit both of these properties, at least to some extent. Um, but of course, the caveat is the list is, is not exhaustive and should definitely be expanded. Finally, some brief conclusions. Um, so we've kind of gone through the four sets of experiments in the paper, um, and I'll just briefly conclude here with some, with some takeaways and some um, ideas and thoughts for future work as well. So we first justified why we care about pretext rationales, and we argued that for reasoning tasks, um, they're important and they will become increasingly important um, as the tasks that our, our field cares about uh, shift in some way. And then we had two research questions about applying pipelines to tasks requiring free text rationales um, and testing joint models for free text rationalization. So I think the key takeaways are first, it's important to determine what your application is. Um, and determine the type of rationale that is most useful for your application. So one option to determine the type of rationale is to do user studies um, and see how people actually rationalize a specific task. And then as for methods, once you've determined the type of rationale that's best suited, whether highlights, free text, or something else, there's no one size fits all method. If you only need plausible explanations, joint models are a good choice for the reasons that I mentioned at the beginning. But otherwise, um, if the task is suited to highlights, you might consider pipelines um, as well as their shortcomings, but um, the architecture might work well for you in that case. Um, if it's suited to free text, you should consider joint models, but definitely use them cautiously. Um, potentially, there's a lot of room for further architecture developments. And you could try testing your task along the two tests that we proposed and potentially also consider expanding the evaluation set. But of course, no model is perfect. Um, these methods don't provide guarantees and there's a lot more research opportunities in this, in this space. Thanks, that's, that's all I have. An earlier version of the papers on archive um, without the uh, raw experiments that I discussed. And yeah, I'm happy to take questions or discuss further thoughts.